This is the first video in a fairly long series of videos about orthogonality and least squares. Towards the end of the video series, we'll get to some really neat concepts like the Gram-Schmidt algorithm, finding the least squares approximation or least squares solution of a system of equations that doesn't have a unique solution, finding orthonormal bases and projections, all kinds of really great ideas. But before we get into um, some of those more advanced ideas, we need to build up some basic definitions and that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to talk about the inner product and an inner product space. So what do we mean by that? So let's, let's take a vector space V, and we've worked with vector spaces before in many of the videos. And out of that vector space V, I'm going to go ahead and select a handful of arbitrary elements, U, V, and W. Given this vector space, I can define what's called an inner product. So given a vector space, I can always define an inner product on that vector space. The notation that I use is right here with kind of these brackets. So bracket u, comma v, n bracket. And all this is is a function. And this function takes as inputs two vectors from your vector space, and the output of the function is a scalar. So it's just a number on the real line. This inner product, most importantly, has a variety of properties. And because it has these properties, it is a valid inner product. So what are the properties that all inner products must have to be a valid inner product? First of all, it doesn't matter which order that I call the inner product, whether I call it u, v, or v, u, I get the exact same number out. So there's kind of this, you know, uh, commutative property of the inner product. Also, if I have a scalar alpha on one of the arguments, I can go ahead and pull that alpha out front of the inner product. So there's kind of this nice you know, linear property in that if I scale one of the vectors by alpha, the overall inner product just gets scaled by alpha. There's also the property that if I have a sum of one of the arguments, I can have kind of this distributive rule where the inner product of u plus w comma v is just the inner product of u and v plus the inner product of w and v. So kind of a distributive rule as well. And then finally, the inner product of u and u is always bigger than or equal to zero. So you can never get a negative number out of an inner product. Also, if it is equal to zero, that means that the vector u must be the zero vector. So that can only happen um, when the vector is u is zero. It's the only way I'm gonna get this lower bound. Note that this inner product, you know, I usually, I'm going to think about it as being defined on Rn or something like that, but inner products are very general concepts. They can be defined on any vector space, so whether that's Rn or the set of polynomials or the vector space of continuous functions, right? There's lots of different vector spaces that we've worked with. You can define an inner product on any of those vector spaces. In this video and a lot of the subsequent videos, for the most part, we're going to be working with vectors in Rn. When we're working with vectors in Rn, this concept of inner product, we give it a special name and we call it the dot product. So when we're talking about the dot product, we talk about the dot product u dot v, and we use this special notation that dot there is actually the dot product between vectors u and v, and we define it as u transpose times v. So the dot product is an inner product. Okay, but in general, the inner product is a much more general concept. The dot product we say is a specific example or the specific instance of an inner product for the special case when I'm working with vector spaces on Rn. So for the special case when I'm working with a vector space in Rn, let's go ahead and write out very clearly what we mean by the dot product. So grab u and grab v. These are just arbitrary vectors in Rn, and then I can compute u dot v, which by definition is u transpose v. It is equal to u1 times v1 plus u2 times v2, right? It's just normal old um, linear algebra vector multiplication. So it's just a product of each dimension added up. Let's go ahead and work a very specific example. Let's say that my first vector that I have is u1, negative 1, 2, 3. And let's say the other vector v that I'm going to work with is 0, 2, 4, negative 3. Well, I can compute the dot product between these two vectors as the 
product of their first dimension, 1 times 0, plus the product of their second dimension, negative 1 and 2, and just keep going down all the line, plus 2 times 4, plus 3 times a negative 3. And if I multiply all this out, 1 times 0 is 0, a negative 1 times 2 is negative 2, 2 times 4 is 8, 3 times a negative 3 is a negative 9, and if I add all that up, I get a negative 3. So that wraps up what we mean by an inner product. An inner product is a very general concept. The inner product always has a variety of properties. If we're working on Rn, we call the inner product the dot product, and the dot product is defined like this, and all it is is just the product of each dimension and add them all up. And we've done one little example here of a dot product computation. In the next video, let's backtrack and examine properties of the inner product and dot product.